Welcome to Purple Chats, a podcast brought to you by the Fuels Institute. Hey everybody, welcome back to Carpool Chats. John Eichberg with the Fuels Institute here and we've got a great program for you today. Uh, earlier in 2021, uh, Fuels Institute commissioned a report to hopefully put to rest this debate, are electric vehicles cleaner than combustion engine vehicles? And take a look at the life cycle emissions of both vehicles from the time we start harvesting the resources until we put those cars to bed at the end of the useful life. As we reached out to our friends over at Picardo Strategic Consulting to do the work for us, they've done some great work for us in the past. And this paper is going to be coming out at the beginning of 2022. And it's going to be a fantastic piece of work that's going to really help move the debate forward. So today I am thrilled to welcome Ruth Ruth Latham and Aravind Ramakrishnan with Ricardo Strategic Consulting. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. So when we started this project uh, six, seven months ago, everything seemed to take a lot longer than I wanted to. Um, you guys got your part done really quick, but our peer review process takes forever. I was really kind of just throwing it to you, say, hey, we really want to understand what's going on. We want to know what has been researched in the past, where the the, the skeletons are, what are the pros, what are the cons of combustion engine, liquid fuel vehicles, the electric vehicles, and the energy that powers them. We wanted you to look at the vehicles and the energy powers that started. So real quick, uh, Ruth, can you kind of give us a quick overview of how you tackled this mammoth project? Yeah, I mean, life cycle analysis as, as a basic science can go as deep as you want it to. It's one of those expanding complexity types yeah. of issues. So what we tried to do with this project was to build on work that was done already with Ricardo for the European Commission, as well as uh, literature that's out in the um, public domain on others who have looked at life cycle analysis for automotive, looking both at the full vehicle um, and at individual components to pull that together into a consistent set of assumptions for a model so that we could you know, compare A to B, um, what different factors have on the total life cycle emissions of a vehicle. Now, Erevin, you guys looked at a lot of research and uh, clearly, when you take on a project of this size, there's so many options to review. And you guys, I think you look at 150 different research projects out there and narrowed it down to the ones most relevant. But there was some consistency in the LCAs that you review. Can you kind of walk us through your high level of review of what you found and the research that's already been done to date? Yeah. Um, yeah, like Ruth mentioned, there were plenty of uh, research papers on this topic. So, one key challenge we faced was uh, defining what needs to be analyzed, setting our boundary conditions right. And once we have that, uh, there, there are a lot of consistencies between multiple researches that we found. Uh, overall, uh, the direction of what we find is that uh, BEVs in the long run are um, less carbon intense than uh, kind of typical IC engine vehicles. But there was a lot of debate on when this parity happens. So we wanted to uh, look into that further. And that was one of our key uh, research uh, topics. And also there were plenty of uh, debate on uh, the sensitivity factors, what factors affect this uh, uh, parity time period. So we wanted to look into that further as well. And uh, what we found was in, was little consistent with the overall direction of the other projects, uh, but we were able to put our opinions on what we thought was the right or for what in our opinion was the uh, reasonable uh, time when this parity happens. So after you guys did the literature review, you came up kind of a, here's where it seems to be harmonizing EVs on average, cleaner than combustion engine vehicles, except in certain use case scenarios. And then you wanted to validate that. So Ruth, can you talk a little bit about um, your choice of modeling and what where you guys went to run the numbers that gave us really the results that I think are we're going to get into in just a second that are so relevant to what we're talking about? Yeah, there are a lot of models available to, to do life cycle analysis on vehicles. Um, we decided to use GREET in order to, to model um, for this study, specifically because many of the analyses done in the US um, in particular, but globally, are using the GREAT platform. Um, and it 
is also available publicly for free, which allows for, you know, peer review and replication of our results so that, um, you know, it's very open and clear uh, what, what our assumptions were and, and how they translate into the model outputs. Um, we didn't want it to be, you know, it's very easy in life cycle assessment to hide a lot of assumptions in, um, in the model inputs. And so we wanted to be as clear as possible about what we were using for assumptions and to have it be transparent to anyone who read the study. And that was critical to us as well. You know, fuel sensitive, we don't have a stake. We don't have a preferred outcome. We want to make sure that the research that you did for us was objective, was transparent. My colleague, Jeff Hobie, talks about the number of black box LCA models that are out there. And the last thing you want to do is try to put forth a, a paper that's trying to resolve some, some concerns from different, different sides of the equation that is clouded in secrecy. So I always, I really appreciate you guys use the great model because it is transparent. It is the Argonne National Laboratory. It's, it is considered the top of the line out there. Um, but you know, one of the th reasons we went into this, Aravin, you, I think you can weigh in on this is I have, this year I've given 55 speeches, 50 of them are electric vehicles. And depending on the audience, I get the questions, well, John, you know, EVs aren't clean. You know, they may have no tailpipe, but they come from power and power can be dirty. Or I'll get, well, you know, John, the EVs have this terrible chemistry and batteries and all these red herrings thrown in. That's one of the reasons we want this paper is try to settle, settle the score. Um, when you look at the life cycle of an EV versus an internal combustion engine, you mentioned there's a point of parity between them and carbon emissions. Let's just talk about the manufacturer of the vehicles and the manufacturer of the energy. Where do they stack up? Before we start putting any miles on the vehicle, where do they kind of stack up compared to one another? Yeah, uh, yeah, there is obviously a lot of talk about uh, EVs being perceived different than what they are. Uh, one thing that you mentioned I felt interesting was that um, there is a different set of assumptions that goes into modeling EVs, especially when you look at uh, states that are less carbon intense than the ones that are uh, more carbon intense in terms of their grid emissions. Uh, we see that there is an inherent advantage in uh, running EVs in states that are less carbon intense. And that said, uh, uh, looking at the manufacturing aspects of it, um, it is uh, uh, the EVs consist of batteries which are uh, inherently more carbon intense to produce than uh, corresponding IC engine vehicles uh, or the engines and transmissions together. Uh, the difference happens considering the overall uh, lifetime greenhouse emissions. When you uh, look at the overall lifetime greenhouse emissions, the EVs we believe is less carbon intense uh, than IC engine vehicles. But if you look at just the manufacturing aspects of it, EVs are more carbon intense. Mm -hmm. So it is really important to put these things into perspective, look at this from a holistic perspective than just the man manufacturing aspects. And I think that the study points out that there are points in the manufacturing process, maybe there's opportunities to reduce the carbon intensity of the production of the electric vehicle mm -hmm. and bring a little more parity. I mean, because right now I think it's like two to one, two and a half to one in terms of carbon intense before they start uh, running down the line, down the road. But the problem comes into when you start putting energy into them and quite quickly, the petroleum based fuel for the combustion engine starts to narrow that gap and the EVs over a period of miles gets to catch up and they actually balance out and become a little greener um, in terms of carbon emissions profile, except in certain sectors where you may have a high carbon intense grid. And I think that's in, was an important finding, Ruth, because I, I think we've, we've run into this problem where uh, a lot of leaders think there's a solution to reducing carbon transportation, it's electrify everything. Electrify mm -hmm. everything everywhere, but right now, when we look at the grid composition of the United States, there are certain markets where it does not make sense to electrify if you have a high efficiency internal combustion engine. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that from the paper's perspective? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think the electrify everything everywhere has an underlying assumption of clean power everywhere. Um, that just isn't the case right now. And so that... that that assumption makes sense, yes, if, you know, everything is solar and wind and um, we're not, you know, using coal fire to to 
charge our vehicles. But um, I think that it's it's important to consider what that mix is and how that mix changes going forward because it's quite critical to the uh, life cycle emission of the the vehicle. And on the battery production side as well, where the power is coming from, where those batteries are being made um, globally is important on the carbon life cycle or the carbon footprint that that battery has as part of its production. So I think that that there are activities that are ongoing right now to improve the efficiency, to improve the um, the location of battery production to reduce the carbon footprint. But as the supply chain sits right now, it's not um, it's not the the best solution in every place, and other changes need to happen before it is. And I think that's the beauty of the way you guys did this paper is you took each section in the supply chain from harvesting the materials to assembling the vehicle to running the vehicle to re to retiring the vehicle and you broke it down as component parts. So now we can look at things like the supply chain efficiencies for battery production. Can we improve that and reduce the carbon intensity there to make the EV cleaner coming off the line? At the same time, when we look at the summary, it was about, <clears throat> I think I calculated the, the difference in carbon emissions over 200,000 mile life. It's about 40% fewer uh, tons of carbon for the EV versus the ICE vehicle. But you also model, Aravind, you modeled hybrid electric vehicles. And the delta between the battery to vehicle and the hybrid was only about 19% or less, I believe, which leads me to think that, you know what, if we can improve the carbon intensity of the fuel going into a hybrid vehicle, we can narrow that gap tremendously and accelerate our path to decarbonization. Am I reading that correctly? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the way we see it is that uh, the hybrid vehicle, uh, we see it as a bridging technology until mainstream BEVs uh, take uh, the technology for BEVs fully matures. And yeah, um, getting the fuel uh, fuel carbon emissions uh, optimized for hybrid electric vehicles is definitely uh, a solution that we see. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you guys did a... You for the people back home, what they did is they analyzed a LCA through the GREEP model, and then they took a whole bunch of sensitivity assessments, and they ran the model based upon different grid intensities for the electricity, different fuel formulations, different driving behaviors, different temperature sensitivities. Um, Ruth, when you look at those sensitivities, were there any, any of those uh, alternative models you guys ran that really kind of struck you as, I didn't expect that to be the result? or that really kind of we need to pay more attention to because it has a much greater impact on our overall approach to decarbonization? I, I think the importance in, you know, vehicle lifetime, um, you know, how how repairable is your vehicle? How long will your vehicle survive? Um, how recyclable are the components of your vehicle? These are our important elements. We have a pretty established supply chain for the recycling of traditional internal combustion engine vehicles. There is the ability in most hybrid vehicles, um, the battery chemistry they use can also be recycled, but we're still working to understand how best to recycle the lithium ion batteries that are used in electric vehicles. And so the, um, the further we go in our ability to both make the batteries have a longer life cycle and reduce the um, impact of recycling the batteries or the impact of the inability to recycle the batteries. Um, these elements have a large impact on whether or not a hybrid vehicle or a electric vehicle at the, the end of its life has a larger carbon impact. Um, and so I think that that's one of the reasons that you see hybrids as a transition um, into electrification on a, on a mass scale. One of the things that struck me when I read it, and I've read it four or five times now, mm -hmm. given a few presentations on it already, <clears throat> was the impact on battery life. And so in the paper, you guys quote the most OEMs, the vehicle manufacturers say that once a battery gets to 70% of its original capacity, it's considered not, it's expired. It's the warranty's out and needs to be replaced. And that can happen at different stages of ownership, depending on how you drive. If you're a more aggressive driver, then you're going to wear that battery out faster. If you're a more timid driver, then you're going to extend that battery out. But I think you guys came out and said, you know, over a 200,000 mile lifetime, depending on driving behavior, the EV owner may have to replace that battery any from 1.2 to two and a half times. Now, when I think about that from a carbon intensity perspective, okay, that changes some things, but you factor that in. 
for me, it's more of an impact on the total cost of ownership, another component of the study. And Irvin, you guys found that the EV over a 10-year life, uh, life cycle um, is a lower cost to own, even with some battery replacement. But my question now comes more into some of the literature review where you looked at cost of first owners, cost of second owners. Um, how impactful is that battery durability on total cost of ownership when we look at it as a whole? I mean, is it something that, that we need to be really concerned about? And is there a way we can address it in a way that makes a lot of sense for the consumer? Yeah, yeah looking at it, uh, we don't really see the driving factor as an immediate, uh, to have an immediate impact on the total cost of ownership. But if you look at it from a, a very logical perspective, yeah, it does. And more so for the second owner than the first owner, because the first owner typically uh, has batteries that are covered by warranties. And also uh, the first owner uh, tends to uh, take up a lot of the vehicle depreciation cost than the actual battery replacement cost. But for the second owner, it's the vehicle component replacements that includes batteries uh, that play a major role. Um, battery replacements are quite expensive. And that's where uh, we look at a portion of battery replacements done using refurbished batteries as well. And uh, battery replacements could anywhere run from a few thousand dollars to even sixteen to twenty thousand uh, dollars, depending on the type of the vehicle. And at that point, it becomes important to look into uh, the vehicle residual value, comparing that against the actual cost of uh, the service, and making addition at that point. Uh, so, yeah, it becomes really interesting for the second and subsequent owners. Uh, things very uh, not so apparent as the driving style uh, becomes a big factor at that point. Yeah, and I think I, that's I think, a good oh, reason. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so, so the other factor for me that's interesting there is that the way a, a traditional ICE vehicle fails is not that the distance you can drive in it gets shorter. Right. Usually it's either an abrupt failure um, or your fuel economy gets worse over time. Um, those are sort of the two. And, and and you notice the abrupt failure, but you don't necessarily notice your fuel economy unless you're a, a real geek who's tracking that constantly. Um, I think the way an electric vehicle fails is that you can go less far with it um, over time and, it, and your range continues to shrink. Um, and becoming accustomed to that as a, as, and thinking about how much range you really need in a vehicle when you're buying an electric vehicle on the secondary market is going to have to be a change in consumer perception um, to avoid buying new batteries or buying replacement batteries. I think the other piece of that is that, that, you know, you expect a major repair on your vehicle to be in the 1800 to three thousand dollar range you know if you needed a new engine for most vehicles that's about where it would be um a battery replacement even though it's going to be more rare than an engine replacement is usually more costly than that so it, there's this kind of profile where a relatively few people will have a a sort of nasty surprise in the secondary market looking for a, a replacement battery and I think that's, you know, that's not the point of this study. It wasn't the the, the driving, but it's something that struck yeah. me. And it kind of lines up with some of the stuff we've been doing with some government agencies looking at equity, transportation mm -hmm. equity, access to affordable, reliable transportation. <clears throat> and I think in our push to decarbonize, we're focused on first generation vehicles, first yeah. owner, get the new vehicles out there. But we sell about 40 to 45 million used vehicles every year in the United mm -hmm. States. And if you're in a lower income market, then you are gravitating towards the used car market. You can't afford a new car if you're in a lower income bracket. And if we're going to be bringing the electric vehicles to the used car market, and there's this potential compromised uh, durability, compromised range, um, we need to figure out a way to quantify that, qualify that, and protect the consumers and help them get into the market. I like your point that it's not that the vehicle won't run. It's just that your range is compromised. That mm -hmm. That changes my perspective a lot because I was getting really concerned saying we're going to be dumping these these EVs on the market and saddling these lower income consumers with a $10,000 battery replacement, but they don't have to do that. They just don't get to drive as far, which is a unique perspective that I hadn't thought about. So I really appreciate bringing that up because I was seriously thinking we're running into a, a train wreck here and we can compromise on the range 
add we get the 70 60 percent battery capacity so that helps the other thing that i want to just bring up before we close here is that the other argument i get about evs are not good john they're terrible for the environment is what are we going to do with all those batteries when they're no longer useful in the car and i think you guys showed the studies about battery redeployment and reuse Irvin, can you talk a little bit about what you guys found that what the potential is to repurpose batteries after their useful life and transportation has expired. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, um, batteries, when they reach their capacity uh, limits to about 70%, that is usually defined by the automakers. Uh, there are a few typical pathways that uh, one can follow. Uh, refurbishing a battery for putting it back in use for vehicles, that's, mm -hmm. that's a valid option. And that is applicable to certain state of health of batteries. For example, if the battery has a certain uh, state of health from 70% uh, to 50%, it is a viable option to follow. Uh, if if the battery falls out of this range, uh, certainly there, there are other potential uses. One such use is, uh, one, su one such use is putting it to use in energy storage applications. Mm -hmm. uh, stationary energy storage applications, and that is being looked at by many auto OEMs. And, and one interesting thing is that there's another third potential pathway here, uh, recycling the batteries at that point and using the material recovered from those to substitute the virgin material used in battery production. That's also a valid pathway. Now it becomes all interesting because the recycling technology is not fully evolved at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, the refurbishment technology is viable and uh, it, 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 it is a really uh, interesting point to look at the, uh, the future as the refurbish, uh, recycling costs go down and the refurbishment costs stay at the current point. How will this industry involve, uh, evolve? Uh, that, that's a very interesting perspective to take. Uh, looks like uh, many autom automotive manufacturers uh, use the refurbishment pathway as uh, something to hold on to the batteries for longer, put the batteries to use for longer mm -hmm. until the recycling technology matures. So that uh, to me is quite interesting. Okay, as you know, as always, whenever we work with Ricardo Consulting, I learn things I didn't expect to learn through the, pro through the project. We always go to you with your RFP, here's the questions you want to answer. And then you guys, we meet like once a week and I'm, every week I'm going, hey, I didn't know that. And it takes me down squirrels. I've commissioned three other white papers based upon this research project alone. My, my colleagues are going, John, we don't have the capacity to do all these work, but it is a great paper. And I think, you know, I'm hopeful that the powers that be that are developing our policies and our strategies to decarbonize, take a look at this very closely because there's so many factors and so many elements that are covered in the paper that can help us accelerate decarbonization, whether it be improving efficiency of combustion engines and lowering the carbon mm -hmm. intensity of liquid fuels, hybridizing vehicles, deploying EVs in the right markets to capitalize on the greener grid. Uh, there's just so many things we can do, consumer education, um, economic analyses to make sure that we are protecting the access to affordable reliable transportation. All these elements are, are factored into this paper and it's I'm really excited to get it out to the public. So guys, thank you so much. If people want to learn more about the work Ricardo Consulting is doing, where can they look, Ruth? Um, so they can go to our website, which is www.ricardo.com. Um, we also are on LinkedIn and Twitter. Yeah, so thank you guys, Ruth Irvin. Thank you very much for joining us today. I can't wait to get the paper out there. Once it's out, we may have you back to talk about the reaction you get from the paper. Um, but thank you very much for all the work you guys have done for us. And for you guys back home, thank you for tuning in to Carpool Chats, and we'll see you next time. See ya.